Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Normally, when I start a talk, I ask, uh, is the most background computer science or biology this time? I will not ask this, but we move further. What is bioinformatics or professor of bioinformatics? What are we doing? We generally uh, analyze, predict more, analyze data, predict models, store biological data. And even the latest is getting a bit challenged now with big data from biology. But what are we doing with this data? This is part of the human genome. Does it tell you? It's just a lot of words, a lot of letters, a lot of letters, um, four letters that change each other. And what is inside there? There is the information of how the genes are made and how the genes are regulated. Because we shouldn't forget that the DNA is the same in our cells, wherever they are, and every time of our life. But which, which genes are expressed is the key story that tells us what will be which tissue, how, which gene will grow how much. Now, what is the change that happens in the last 15 years in bioinformatics, genetics, and medicine? It has to do with the cost per row megabytes DNA sequence. Why is it important? When we can see what is the DNA, when we can see which genes are expressed, we really have a clear view. And this was previous. We see that in 2001, it was 10,000. It cost $10,000 to have one megabyte. Earlier, it was even the work of a postdoc to do that. And right now, we are less than 0.1% of a dollar. And if I go farther, and we can see what are the cost per genome, we see this dramatic change where, do I have a pointer? Ah, this is a pointer, clear. So here we go in 100 million, and now we are getting close to $1,000 per genome. What is the Moore's law? Moore's law is the law that says that every 18 months, the transistors, the chips, are getting faster from the computer. And this is getting much faster than this. What happens really here? There it was the, the technology to read the genome, to read DNA chains here through the new computers that we call next generation sequencing computers. They are kind of computers. What they are doing is, in, instead of earlier just to put markers and analyze sequence by sequence, we said, OK, just forget about that. Take the unknown genome, cut it in pieces, read small pieces of this, and then get a big computer to assemble it all together and see what is expressed. That is what they are, that's how the technology changed and what makes it all faster. Now, there is a we have the genome, we have the data. The problem is to make, to make something out of it, to understand them. And what about the cost? That's why we say that if for the analysis of some tissue, what is expressed, this costs around 10%, the, the cost of the real analysis is the most expensive part and the bottleneck night round. Because the infrastructure to get the sample is there, to put it in the machine is there, but there is not the infrastructure to analyze this one terabyte data that coming out of one run of these machines in just three hours. Now, there were so many nice talks before about the growth of bioinformatics, so I will not stay on that and go into that, which is my, the field where I'm working, and this is genomics. A uh, few words before about biomarkers. Why now we are coming more to understand biomarkers? Because biomarkers, we can identify them as characteristics that are measured and considered as an objective indicator of the pathological state of a problem organism. In order to find biomarkers, what we need is to see what is the genome and the gene expressed in a group of uh, patients with a specific disease and with a group of healthy, uh, a healthy group and make a comparison. This is all what we need. And when we see that there is in a gene a difference, or on the nucleotide, or on the, first on the expression and then on the nucleotide, we can say, OK, this could be a very significant characteristic for this specific disease. Now, what has this all this to do with big data? When we start from NGS and microarray, we are around 50 to 100 gigabyte data. Then we start the pre-processing. Uh, background correction, a number of work, 
it's getting a little bit less, and then we're going to see this what is expressed in which pathway is it analyzed? Is it maybe a cancer pathway? Is it something with, with hypertension? And further we go and we're going to prioritize genes and move over to biomark studies, biomedical signature. So we see how the data move around all our work on this. Now we'll go to one specific example. This is what changed the central dogma the last uh, that we had that is still on the books of biology. The central dogma was we have DNA, then RNA, and then we get protein. And then we realized that no, there are on the DNA are also other genes that are called RNA, and what they do is stop the protein even we have the gene. These are the called microRNA, and they came in game in 2001. What happens with them, it's not like by chance that the uh, economists wrote in 2007 that the RNA revolution with the biologist Big Bang. And that is what happened. MicroNAs are involved in many diseases and in development. Why now is already there that we have specific microRNAs that are currently being pursued for clinical candidates? A big number of them because when we have a disease state, we see something like 2,000 genes change, but we see something like 30 microRNAs change. And these very specific small genes are much better marked as biomarkers than the thousands of genes that we see that change. Now, this is all a field in flex. As we can understand more about what is expressed in the, in the genome, we learn also more, and we see how from 2002, we found out that we have in different organisms up to 20,000 microRNAs. We learned that from 100 microRNAs in 2001, we have now 1,800, and still we're not sure what is microRNA and what is not. Um, what is the annual number of U.S. and European published patents applications related to microRNAs? We see that we have a big explosion here coming up. Now, we have also a patent on that. This is the patent of finding where the microRNA targets on the gene. And this is found first computationally, saying what is really the microRNA doing? Imagine there is a big protein and it needs a guide, and this guide go and say, here, find your gene, bind there, that's your target. This was found computationally and then experimentally verified. Um, now, where is the story? The story is to see active pathways on a disease and see what genes are responsible for change in this active pathway. Until now, we did this with, uh, only with protein coding genes, and now microRNAs are involved. How much time I have? Uh, OK. How much time I have? OK, good. Now, Having this, the problem was to put the microRNAs into this game of the pathways. I think that one primary work is in order to put them, you need to know how they are regulated, these microRNAs, and where they start. I will not go into details here. I want to say that, move over all this, because it's maybe very specific, just go to say, you, maybe all of you have seen chromosomes, Chromosome chromatin chain, these are small nucleus, and this is the DNA. This is the relation for DNA and chromosome. Now, what we want to see related to some genes is who is regulating the gene. Here is the gene, and here are different proteins that are regulated that. Until a few years ago, the only way to find what binds here was all the specific experiments that may cost more than half a year, or computational work. What we have now is that all the technology changes in order also to understand what happens in the, in the cell. What we have now is, okay, we say, if we want to see where protein binds, let's take the protein that binds of the DNA, cut it out, fish it out, and get then wash it, and then get the small DNA places where it bound, put it in a sequencer, these magic boxes that are called sequencer, and then we get the pieces of DNA. Having this, now the game starts to understand where they are. And I will not go more into detail to that, just to show you how this sequence data looks really and what, how do we see them and analyze. You see here is 
that what we call epigenetic data. This is all this that change in the environment from that, that has to do, that is coming now, and it's not really the DNA, but what happened on the DNA. Here are pull to markets, and just to give you an example, what happens at the end, we get all this together, try to understand, for example, where a start of a gene is and how we do it. I will not go more in detail. We use what we know, we use machine learning, and then we find the start of few things. I will go much faster through that. Um, and the story is that at the end we have to see how good we are. But how can we see how good we are for something that we don't know how to start as the microRNA genes? What we did in this story was we had uh, genes that didn't express a protein and express all the genes, and we tested with them. This all worked well and was coming in nature communication. Now, having the start of the gene, we can go better here on all this. What is the story? The story is to refine gene regulatory networks. You can imagine as pathways and genes that play together, and microRNAs came now into the game. When we have different data, we want to see how they connect, and the one who is the bigger connector is normally the most interest. This is what is possible to get through some software, of course. Uh, a number of work coming from the group. I think the only thing I want to say is as example we had about cancer, just to say ovarian cancer. One example, we had data of patients with early ovarian cancer and late ovarian cancer. We saw the T signature of protein-coded genes and microRNAs, and then through some analytics, it was published in PNS, we could find that finally a group of microRNAs, which were all hosted together, were responsible for the change for thousands of genes. When we went back to the patient, we found that the patient we had, which had mostly expressed this microRNA cluster, had a better survival curve than the others, indicating that it's a good biomarker and very important for slowing down the ovarian cancer development. I think I should finish. Um, this would tell us why, maybe only one word. What is called personal medicine? This is an example of a, a singular a SNP. For this SNP, this was known that it exists in 60% of, we can say, white people, Caucasian men, and was, host, and was the reason for hypertension. We didn't know why, and what we could found is that this was a target of a microRNA if we had a change, just a change in all the genome from A to C. The microRNA couldn't bind, we have a very high HDR1, and these were leading to hypertension. Now, what means also personal medicine? If someone is coming with hypertension, we can first check, does it have this mutation? Then we have a very significant medicament for him which can lower the HDR1. If it is not, we go for the next question and see what happens, what we have to do with him. Now, just to finish, that um, our work is integrated in Ensemble, in the European browser for Genome ABI, and we have a lot of users. Starting here in Greece from 2009, we are moving up and having currently actually, let's say, we have more than 100,000 users per year, more than 10,000 10, users per month on our website with different programs. And this is the real people behind the work. And thank you for all your time. Thank you very much.